So now I would like to introduce to you uh, Dr. Carrie Donahue. She is a has her doctorate in veterinary medicine from the University of Wisconsin. She's also trained in veterinary acupuncture, herbal medicine, homeopathics, Reiki, and animal massage. Uh, you can tell from just listening to her for five minutes that she has a passion for natural care for animals. And her veterinary practice in Madison specializes in integrative care with a focus on nutrition and maintenance. And so it is my delight to be able to introduce to you Dr. Carrie Donahue. Welcome, Dr. Donahue. Oh, thank you. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to talk today about natural care for pets. So, would you like me to just get started? That would be wonderful. Okay, okay. So, I'm going to talk today about laying a foundation of good health naturally for pets. And then I'm going to go through some of the most common things that I see in my practice that I can make a big difference with treating animals naturally. So, there are so many things. And, you know, animals respond so well to natural medicine, to integrative, to alternative methods, and that I just love using it because, because of the fact that animals respond so well and there is a minimal amount of, if anything, any side effects, not like a lot of the medications that are out there. So we'll just get started, laying the foundation for good health. And what I have found is that the immune system of animals is absolutely the number one most important thing. It's the animal's own natural healing system. If you can keep your pet's immune system as strong and as healthy as possible, your animal will benefit in so many ways and will be able to naturally defend itself against disease and illness. So the truth is that up to 80% of the immune system resides in the cells that line the GI tract. Uh, so feeding a high quality food is probably the number one thing that you can do to keep your pet as healthy as possible and keep its immune system as strong as possible. So it, we'll see as I go through the presentation all of the different issues that I talk about. Food is probably one of the biggest things that you can do to impact your animal's health. Um, providing a clean environment, fresh air, grounding possibilities. This is so important too and it's something that I think is sometimes overlooked. I mean, we're all living inside many of us, many of our animals too don't get as much fresh air and the ability to, to interact with nature as, you know, might be the best thing for them. So that's always an important thing. Um, vaccinating only as necessary. This is one of those things that, um, you know, is getting a little bit more press now as people start to realize and veterinarians start to realize in the whole medical profession that, you know, maybe we don't have to vaccinate our animals as frequently as was always recommended. So with every vaccine that your vet recommends to you, it's important to talk about your lifestyle, your pet's lifestyle, and the risk of actually coming into contact with some of those diseases that we vaccinate for and knowing that there are titers available for vaccines. So a titer is a blood test that can check your animal's immunity against certain diseases. There are titer tests available for the viral diseases, so rabies in dogs and cats, distemper virus, parvovirus. Those are the diseases that you can run a titer for and you can see if your animal actually needs that vaccine. Some of the bacterial diseases that there are vaccines available for, like Bordetella or kennel cough, Lyme disease, leptospirosis, those, those diseases, when your animal gets a vaccine, they don't hold a titer for them. So those are the ones that you would have to vaccinate your animal against every single year. But it's, it's really important to talk to your vet about, you know, is my animal really at risk of coming into contact with leptospirosis? Lyme disease, Bordetella, do I really need those vaccines? And avoiding over-vaccination, I think, can go a long way in keeping your pet's immune system very strong. And finally, limiting exposure and using only as needed those pesticide, the chemical flea and tick treatments, the dewormers, and the heartworm preventatives. So my recommendation to my clients and my patients is to use these products 
really as needed and as minimally as possible. There are some really great natural flea and tick treatments that are available out there that will not have any side effects on the animal and are really very effective. And so I recommend using those as much as you can. And if your dog or your cat is coming home with ticks, well, then going forward and maybe, you know, using something like a Frontline or Advantix or Vectra or one of those chemical flea and tick treatments if you absolutely have to. Um, and then the heartworm preventatives, too. Heartworm disease is, is transmitted by mosquitoes. So I recommend using the heartworm preventatives during mosquito season. So that means from about May, June through November, and you can really stop giving the heartworm preventative after we get a good frost or two and the mosquitoes are gone. You give your animal the final dose of heartworm preventative and they can go through, they give them a break in the winter and then do a heartworm test in the spring and start up again in May or June. Most heartworm preventatives also have an intestinal dewormer in them. So again, it's not something that they really need in the winter. For those of us living in Wisconsin, there's not a lot of risk of your animal even, you know, coming into contact with fleas, ticks, mosquitoes in the middle of winter. So we're lucky in that we can give our animals a break from those things during the winter months. Okay, so going into the most common issues that I see in animals that I can really make a big difference with treating naturally, number one is arthritis. And this is something that really affects so many animals as they get older. The number two thing I see, allergies, and right now in Wisconsin we're going through a really heavy allergy season and I see a lot of animals that are itchy and uncomfortable, so uh, we can make a big difference for them with natural treatments. And then the last thing is anxiety, and this is something that affects so many animals. Just You know, and animals can get stressed out for a variety of reasons, and there are a lot of things that you can do naturally. So the first one, arthritis, otherwise known as osteoarthritis, degenerative joint disease. You can naturally ease pain, resolve inflammation, and restore movement and help your pet feel comfortable. The most important thing, as I'll say this over and over again, is feeding your pet the highest quality of food that you possibly can and making sure that you're feeding them an anti-inflammatory food. And for animals, this means eliminating grains, feeding a low-carbohydrate diet, and high-protein, high-good quality protein. So eliminating the wheat, corn, oats, soy from the foods. Now, one of the things that I've noticed with a lot of the pet foods out there is that, you know, they're kind of jumping on this bandwagon of grain-free foods. And that's wonderful, but a lot of the foods, they still are high-carbohydrate foods, and you want to get the carbohydrate count low with animals. So looking for ingredients like pea fiber, pea protein, white potatoes, those sorts of things, they'll kind of sneak in there, and, and it gets the carbohydrate count up, but they can still say, well, we're grain-free. And it's, it's good if you can find a food that has a high-quality protein as the first couple of ingredients. Making your own dog food, this is not as, not as complicated as it might seem. A very, very basic rule of thumb that I recommend for healthy dogs is going one-third protein, one-third starch, and I do a starchy vegetable like a sweet potato or pumpkin or squash, and then one-third regular vegetable. Of course, you have to add in a calcium supplement and multivitamin and mineral supplement, but really anybody can make their own homemade dog food or cat food, and it's not that difficult. The next step away from doing the homemade food is to feed a raw food, and there are some really great, very, very high-quality raw foods out there that are either frozen or freeze-dried, and they make it very easy for people to feed their animals raw foods without having to prepare raw meat and go through all of that. So they're, they're absolutely 100% complete nutrition for the animals, um, and you're, they're getting everything that they need, and they're getting a really high-quality food. So using human-grade meats, even looking for some of the canned foods out there, if, that, if that's going to work the best for you, but trying to find a human-grade protein. So a lot of the foods have, you know, animal meat byproducts, 
meat meals, and those do provide the protein requirements for your dogs and cats, but they're not the best quality. So as much as you can find human-grade meats, the better. If you can eliminate preservatives, additives that are in a lot of the dry foods, a lot of the canned foods, that's great. So again, fresh is best as much as possible. And even if you're, you know, feeding your pet a homemade meal once a week or twice a week or mixing in half homemade and half canned or half dry food, your pet is going to benefit and they're going to be healthier because of it. Adding in probiotics and digestive enzymes can help every single animal. And it's amazing how much really supporting the GI tract can make a difference for something like arthritis. Adding in those digestive enzymes helps them process the food better, helps with any inflammation, can make them feel better and move better. And really, it's never too early to start. And I, I say this with animals that come in to see me for holistic care and all of that stuff, don't wait until your animal is showing signs of disease or showing signs of illness or moving stiffly or anything like that. Start as soon as you can, as young as you can, to add in some of the fresh foods, making your own foods, or even just getting them on a grain-free diet. Now, there are a lot of different supplements out there that can make a difference for animals that have arthritis. So glucosamine chondroitin is one of those that it, it really can help. And there are a lot of products out there right now that have glucosamine chondroitin, really helpful. But then you can add in some other supplements, and a lot of those are, have combinations of different ingredients in them, like MSM, green lip muscle, otherwise known as PERNA, can be very helpful. Uh, vitamin C and antioxidants. The omega-3, 6 fatty acids are usually something that you would do in addition to a glucosamine chondroitin supplement, and they're a natural anti-inflammatory, can really help animals. So you can do krill oil, salmon oil, calamari oil. There are a whole different, a, a lot of varieties out there of different things that you can add in. Really, anything that you take for yourself as far as a fish oil supplement is going to be fine to give to your dog or your cat. Some of the herbals that I use for animals that have arthritis, Boswellia, otherwise known as frankincense, is my number one natural anti-inflammatory pain herbal. And then curcumin, the extract from turmeric, is the next one that I use. And you can find glucosamine chondroitin supplements that also have Boswellia and curcumin in them, and that's perfect. If you can combine everything into one supplement, even better. It just makes it more simple. But those herbs, Boswellia, curcumin, are just wonderful as a natural way to make your animal feel better. And really, what I have found, they're the best alternatives to a, like an NSAID or a natural anti-steroidal, anti-inflammatory pain medication, like an aspirin sort of thing. Homeopathics that I use, probably the number one would be Arnica. and Some other ones are the Roostox or the Belladonna. The, it's kind of important to talk to somebody who's well-versed in homeopathic remedies that can give you an idea of what would be the best homeopathic remedy for your pet. But those are some of the ones that are commonly used. And then some physical therapies, acupuncture, arthritis is the number one thing that I do acupuncture for pets. Uh, it can really, really help them out, help them feel better. And the nice thing about acupuncture is, you know, it's not a supplement. It's not something that they have to eat, take in, go through their GI tract. Some animals that have a sensitive stomach that don't do well with a lot of supplements do really well with acupuncture. So it's just another alternative Chiropractic care is, is helpful, too, because if animals have joint pain, either in their elbows or their hips or their knees, a lot of times they're moving differently so their backs can get out of alignment, and doing a chiropractic treatment can help them feel better and move better that way. Uh, doing massage is great, and you don't have to be a certified massage therapist to do massage on your animal. Really even just doing light massage, moving the skin over the body, along the back, down the legs, 
if your animal enjoys that, it's going to make them happier and it's going to make them feel better. Any type of light massage is going to improve blood flow to the area that you're massaging. And it's going to bring oxygen in, it's going to help inflammation, and it's going to help your pet feel better. So really, it's nice to be able to talk to somebody who knows animal massage, but if you're just petting your animal, doing a light circular massage on their body, if they enjoy it, it's going to help. The last thing that I've had good success with are Adequin injections. And Adequin, it's kind of like a glucosamine supplement, but it's in a liquid form, and it's injected once a week for about four weeks and then kind of as maintenance. But this is another thing where, you know, you're not giving a supplement to, to an animal that might have a sensitive stomach. You're doing it in a different way, and you can learn how to give these injections at home, and that can really help. Okay, moving into the next subject. This, this allergies are something that I see so often in the spring, in the fall in Wisconsin. We're just really hit hard with the pollens that are out there, so the environmental allergens. But then there are plenty of animals that have allergies and hypersensitivities to food. And allergies are just the result of an immune system that's overreacting or that's hyperreactive to pollen that's out in the environment or allergens that are in the environment or in your home or the potential allergens that are in the food. So as much as we can kind of keep the immune system healthy, again, you're going to make a big difference and you're going to help your animal deal with allergies. So going into environmental allergies, you can tell if your animal has environmental allergies because they might be licking at their feet or their paws. They might have a red chest or their belly is red, armpits are itchy, they might have red or watery eyes, and it can also affect the respiratory tract if they're breathing, breathing in the pollen. So they might be coughing or gagging, really any area that comes into contact with the pollens that are outside can affect your pet. If you notice that your dog or cat might have some skin that has turned dark brown or black, that's evidence of chronic inflammation. And it can often mean that there is a bacterial or a yeast secondary infection. A lot of times animals that come into contact with those allergens, they'll affect the skin, the skin will become irritated, your, your pet will start scratching and then the bacteria and the yeast can move in secondary and cause infections. So my approach to allergies is to treat from the inside and to treat from the outside. So this dual approach is so important, kind of laying the groundwork on the inside and then treating from the outside for more acute situations. Internally, the anti-inflammatory diet makes a huge difference. If you can heal the gut, get the GI tract as healthy as possible, with those probiotics, the digestive enzymes, feeding a good food, you're going to make a huge difference with how your animal reacts to allergens in the environment. Again, minimizing vaccinations. And this is something that it's just so important, and it's, the connection is not always made. If your animal is itchy, if it's spring or the fall, and they're having a reaction to something that's out there, do not give them a vaccination. And I'll have it, animals that come in to see me um, for alternatives to the allergy medications. And I'll look through the history and see that they just had, you know, a rabies vaccine and a leptospirosis vaccine and a Lyme vaccine the week before. Anytime you give a vaccine, when your animal is going through a reaction like this, where the immune system is doing something, it's trying to fight off those allergens, if you give a vaccine, it just confuses the immune system more because then it says, okay, now I have to deal with, with this vaccine that was given and I have to deal with what it, this onslaught of allergens from the environment, and it can just make things worse. So avoiding vaccinations in the middle of allergy season is really important. Some supplements that I will recommend for animals that have allergies, quercetin is nice. It's kind of considered a natural antihistamine, so that can make a big difference. Nettles, too. Nettles is an herbal that you can start to add in with your pet's food. With both of those, it's, they're not as effective in the middle of allergy season, so if your animal is having a reaction at the moment, 
adding in the quercetin, adding in the nettles probably won't have a huge effect. If you know that your pet gets allergies, start these supplements a couple of months before allergy season hits and kind of lay the groundwork with them so that when, when your pet does come into contact with them, the body will be better able to respond. Milk thistle is a wonderful, wonderful detoxifier and herbal that I really think any animal can benefit from, but especially those that have allergies. And milk thistle helps to support the function of the liver, and it helps the liver to detoxify. The liver is the organ that takes the histamine that's produced in the body in, in response to the allergens, and it helps to flush out the histamine. So by adding in milk thistle, you're, you can help the liver to do its job. Eyebright is one of those herbs that's very helpful for animals that really get those red and watery eyes. And you can give eyebright the herb itself orally. You can also do compresses of the eyebright tea, make a compress for your animal's eyes. If they'll tolerate that, you can hold a tea bag, a cool tea bag on their eye or close to their eye, and that can help soothe things. And then euphrasia is, is the Latin name for eyebright, but euphrasia is the name of the homeopathic remedy that is the same thing. And a lot of animals respond really well to getting the euphrasia homeopathic remedy, either orally or you can also find that in eye drops. And then finally, plant sterols. And plant sterols are very helpful in moderating or modulating the immune system. So a hyperactive immune system, the plant sterols will help to tone it down, and hypoactive immune system, so if your animal is getting sick all the time, the plant sterols will help to boost it up, kind of brings it into balance. Sort of a natural corticosteroid in the body. They really work well, and those can be used if your animal is having a reaction. You can get the plant sterols into them, and they can really help. Okay, and now moving into the external aspect. Probably the number one thing that you can do if your pet is having a reaction to pollens outside is to remove the allergens. And this is something that I have found a lot of people just don't really even think about. They don't think about bathing their animals. If, you know, in the spring or in the fall or both, bathing your pet a couple times a week can make a huge difference just removing the allergens from their bodies. I recommend that pet owners keep some baby wipes on hand or even a shampoo solution with a washcloth to wipe their pet down every time it comes in from being outside and making sure that you're getting in between the toes anywhere your pet is in contact with the grass or the pollens that are out there, bottoms of the feet, the belly, all over around the face. Just give them a wipe down once they come in from being outside and you're removing the the item that is causing the irritation. So that can really help. And then also using one of those cone collars, and I know it's awful and I know the animals hate it, but it can really help. If your pet is licking at its feet constantly, your pet is not, the, the skin is not gonna have a chance to heal. So if you can just break the cycle by using one of the cone collars for a, even a couple of days, up to a week, you can help your body, your pet's body heal and, you know, take away, take away part of the problem, which is them licking and scratching at themselves. So some things that you can use to treat topically, if the skin is red and irritated, a calendula salve is very, very helpful. And you can find salves that have St. John's wort in them, chamomile in them, comfrey, a lot of those herbals can be very soothing and very healing. Lavender essential oil is an oil that's very, very safe for animals, and it's very gentle. So this is something that you can use directly on your pet if they have red, irritated skin. If they lick it, that's okay. It's not going to do any harm. But what I will often do is take some calendula salve. Some of those have lavender oil in them already. But sometimes I will add in some lavender, mix it up, and then apply that to, to the pet's skin. Green or black tea compresses are really helpful for animals that develop hot spots, or those really red, irritated skin rashes. 
that can be helpful. And then colloidal silver is another one, kind of an antiseptic, will help with any of those secondary infections. And then moving into food allergies. So a lot of times food allergies and environmental allergies do go hand in hand. But specifically animals that food, have food allergies, I most often see that they come in not so much licking their paws and scratching their armpits and their bellies, but they're scratching around their face and around their muzzle and they're rubbing their head on the ground. These are the animals that often get those chronic ear infections. We can certainly see ear infections with environmental allergies, but most often there's a food sensitivity component as well. So there is a great company that I wanted to mention that can help you diagnose if your pet does have food allergies. And it's a company that was started by Dr. Jean Dodds in California. It's called Hemopet. And they have a test, it's called NutriScan, a saliva test for food sensitivities. You can go online and you can order this kit. They send it to you and you can get a saliva sample from your pet and send it in and they'll give you the uh, the diagnosis of what your animal has sensitivities to. It's very, very helpful. And it's more, I found that it's, um, it's more helpful than a blood test for food allergies. So I use the NutriScan test all the time. Treatment for food allergies is finding a food, finding a diet that doesn't have any of those potential allergens in it. So even if you don't go, go through the food allergy testing, you can try feeding your pet a novel protein diet. So finding a protein that they've never had before, they've never come into contact with. So this might be something like venison or bison or rabbit, something totally new, and then keeping it as simple as possible. So limited ingredient diet. And this is really where making your own food can, can be huge because you would have complete control over everything that your pet is getting. Uh, making sure that you eliminate the most common food allergens, the corn, the wheat, soy, chicken, and beef are the most common proteins that animals have allergies to. And chicken and beef, they find their way into so many of the pet foods, even if it's not listed on the label of the pet food. Uh, there are a lot, of, a lot of chicken and beef that can, the proteins that can end up in those foods. And another thing, it's really easy to see an itchy pet and to say, oh, my pet probably has allergies. Well, there are other things that I've even been fooled by that can cause itchiness in pets. Flea allergy dermatitis is really common. And this is something where your pet doesn't have to have a flea infestation. The fleas are out there in the grass, they're out in the environment, and it just takes one flea to jump on your pet, to bite it, to set off this allergic reaction. So even if you don't find any fleas on your pets, they might have a reaction to a flea bite from the environment. Uh, the other thing, mites, there are two different types of mites, the sarcoptic mange mite or scabies mite and then the demodex mites. Scabies mites cause intense, intense itching where your pet just cannot even take a step without scratching. Demodex mite, the, the demodex mite is a type of mite that lives in the hair follicles normally. We have demodex mites, animals have demodex mites. And when the immune system is suppressed, that's when those mites will flourish and they can cause hair loss. Sometimes it's itchy, sometimes it's not. So it, it's, it's possible that it can cause something that looks like allergies. So it's important to take your pet into the vet and have it checked for some of these other things. Pyoderma, just a basic primary skin infection, whether it's yeast or bacterial, dry skin can do it, and even dental disease. If you see your pet rubbing its face on the ground or rubbing its head, scratching at its face, it could be that its teeth are, you know, maybe it has an infected tooth. Maybe it's got a loose tooth, something in its mouth that's bothering them. So it's important to always have those things ruled in or ruled out. Okay, and moving on to our last subject, anxiety and stress. How you can calm fears and ease the mind naturally. 
so many animals will have some sort of anxiety, whether it's separation anxiety or even just situational fireworks, phobias, thunderstorm phobias, um, animals that get stressed out when they come into contact with other animals, with certain people, so even car rides, things like that. There are so many things that you can do to calm anxiety before going to something like a medication. Probably my first line for any animal that has anxiety is to recommend trying flower essences. And there is a company called Box Flower Essences that makes this blend called Rescue Remedy. And I'm sure a lot of people have heard of it. It's made for humans. They've also come out with a veterinary line that's used for pets. And it can work wonders for animals that are stressed out. Um, you, can, you can buy the human formula and you can use it on your pet. Just put a couple of drops in their water dish. You can put a couple of drops directly in their mouth. You can put them on your hands and pet them with it. The way that the flower essences work, it's kind of like an energy medicine. So any way that you expose your pet to it can make a difference. It doesn't have to go directly in the mouth. You can put it in a spray bottle with some water and spray it around your pet spray it in your car, put some on a bandana, put that around your pet's neck. So really, it really works in a variety of different ways, which makes it nice and easy to use. So Rescue Remedy is a great one. Also, again, lavender, the essential oil, you can diffuse that if you have an essential oil diffuser in your home or in your car, or you can use that topically. And for calming, I recommend taking some lavender oil and putting it on the pads of your pet's feet. And that way it gets absorbed directly into their system. If they lick it, again, it's okay. It's not going to do them any harm. And it might also help, you know, if they take it internally anyway. So that's a great one for calming. Using the feline and canine pheromone collars. And feel away is a common one that's used, the DAP for dogs. I use Nurture Calm collars. And these are the feline and canine hormones that make them feel like everything is okay. So I really like the collars that you can use. You put them on, they're like those old-fashioned flea collars. They last for about 30 days. They're completely non-toxic and your pet is breathing in those pheromones that make them feel like everything is fine and it can really help them calm down. A homeopathic remedy for fear, anxiety, is aconitum, and you can get that over the counter, give your animal a few pellets um, before a stressful event, or you can do it daily too if they just tend to have separation anxiety every time you leave. That can really help. The herbals that I use for stress, valerian root is probably the number one um, most effective calming herbal that I have found. So valerian is very effective by itself. You can, again, you can get that, the, the human supplement valerian, and give that to your pet. Just give them a smaller amount. If you give them too much, it's probably just going to cause them to sleep. So giving that about an hour or two before, you know, the anticipated event. So if the fire, you know, fireworks are going to happen or a thunderstorm is coming, giving them the valerian root probably a couple of hours before that event can really help. Skullcap, passionflower. Catnip is a great one, especially for cats. It's calming. Sometimes it gets them worked up, but really overall it makes them just feel better about things. So catnip is great in dogs too, anything in the mint family, but, but really catnip can help dogs and cats. Ashwagandha is an herb that is kind of in the class called adaptogens, so it helps animals adapt to stressful situations. And ashwagandha is not something that you would give uh, an hour or two before an anticipated event, but it's something that you would kind of give as a supplement every day with their food to kind of build up in their system so they can deal with stressful events better. Other supplements that are out there, L-theanine is a green tea extract, and that can work great, tryptophan, colostrum, so many different things that you can try, so many different natural things before going to something major like a, you know, a pharmaceutical medication. Acupuncture is helpful. Again, the massage makes animals feel better. Reiki, Chinese herbs, those thunder shirts can be very effective. And you can even go online 
and find out how to make your own thunder shirt or find out how to make a wrap for your animal for stressful situations. So you can do it yourself. You don't have to go out and buy a, one of those thunder shirts. So that comes to the end of the, the presentation. And really, again, laying the solid foundation for health. By, by good food is so important. You can harness your pet's own healing abilities and make them happier and healthier. Thank you so much. And if we have thank any you. questions. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Donahue. I learned so much from all of this information. Okay. Um, on this last slide, I want to point out to those who are attending our webinar, we have your contact information and the name of your practice in Madison, Wisconsin. So thank mm -hmm. you for sharing. And we do have a lot of questions, um, both in our QA box and some in our chat box. So let's get started. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so th there's a lot of questions about pet food. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm going to try to combine them. Um, okay. One uh, one common request is, do you have an actual recipe written for homemade dog food? So not just one third protein, one third this, one third that, but do you have an actual recipe? And would that be something that they would be able to get by visiting your website? And mm -hmm. they would and they would like to know if you prefer one kind of homemade pet food over another. Like for example. Chicken is your protein versus pork is your protein, you know, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, yes, and I do actually, if you, if anybody that's interested in getting a recipe that I have that I, that I typically hand out to clients who are interested in making their own foods that has everything else you need, like I mentioned, you want to make sure that you're adding in a calcium supplement, adding in multivitamin mineral, that's where you really have to be careful and make sure that your animal is getting everything that they need. Cats have different um, vitamin and mineral requirements than dogs do. So send me an email or call. I don't have it posted on my website, but that's a really good idea, and I might do that. I should do that. But in the meantime, just call or email, and I can email back to you my homemade recipe for dog food. And it's very simple. What I often recommend, and this is on the sheet that I have, is making the food once a week, just putting everything into a crock pot and making enough that you might need for the week for your pet and then storing it in the freezer or the refrigerator so you're not making food every single day because that can get to be a lot. And as Excellent. far as the as far as the different protein types, you know, and the interesting thing that I have found too is even animals that have sensitivities to chicken and beef in the commercial dog foods do just fine if they're fed a human grade chicken that you go to the grocery store and you buy that you would eat yourself if you give that to your dog that even has a sensitivity to chicken they do fine with it so i think it just makes a huge difference on the quality of protein um, and really whatever is the easiest for you to buy and for you to make and for you to maintain making their food. I think, you know, chicken, beef, turkey, pork, fish, any of those common proteins are, are really great for animals and they're going to love it. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, here's another question. It says, don't dogs already produce high levels of vitamin C? Why would you have to add vitamin C? Oh, vitamin C is one of, it's kind of like, I mean, it's an antioxidant, so it's going to help the free radical production in animals. So it's one of those things where I think it's helpful for any animal to get, especially if they have an issue like arthritis or allergies or especially something that kind of means that the pH level in their body is a little bit off, whether that's yeast infections or bladder infections, a lot of times that's indicating that the pH level is not where it should be. So adding in some vitamin C can help in many regards. And it's certainly not something that you have to do, but it's one of those things that uh, can be helpful, especially with arthritis or any issue like that. Mm -hmm. that and this is my own question. Mm -hmm. Would it be that dogs or cats that are, are, are ill or older may not be making as much vitamin mm -hmm. C as they did mm -hmm. when they were younger? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and yeah, exactly. And it's just kind of like one of those supplements that you can add in to help your pet, especially as it gets older, and it's not 
its body is not do, making those things like it, it had been, definitely. Another question, um, lots of questions on the dog food. Uh, can, it, for those of us that cannot make or don't have time to make or are not going to make the homemade dog food that you recommend, can you name a couple of better lines of dog food that you think are are good in the stores? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so kind of the next step that I, I mentioned from the homemade dog food, and, you know, it's so understandable. A lot of people don't have time to make food and kind of keep on top of all of that stuff. And there are very good alternatives out there. Um, there are, there's a Wisconsin-based company called Stella and & Chewy's, and they make frozen and they make freeze-dried raw food. And it's a really good quality. It's ultra-pasteurized. You don't have to worry so much about the contamination of the raw food. They do a very good job of, of that. And most animals really love it. It's, it's great, high quality. Honest Kitchen, Sojo's, Fresh is Best. Those are a couple of the other raw food companies out there. Getting into the canned foods and the, the kibble, one company that I really like, again, it's Wisconsin-based, is called Fromms. They make grain-free, high-quality dog and cat food. Um, another one is called American Natural Premium, and it's very similar in quality to Fromms, but it's a lower-cost alternative. So those are two of my favorites that I recommend. They have limited ingredient diets, so you're not worrying about a lot of the extras that are added in, those preservatives and all of that stuff. So those are great foods that are out there. Excellent. Excellent. Um, here's a question of a person who has a 14-year-old dog that's recently been put on enalapril 5 milligrams and mm -hmm. vet medin 5 milligrams. Mm -hmm. Are there any natural products that could take the place of these medications? And if so, how do you wean off the meds? Mm, that is a great question. So those medications are typically given for animals that have heart disease or even congestive heart failure. And there are some wonderful herbals that I use. I don't know, every animal is so different, so I don't know if they would be able to take the place of those medications, but adding in a couple of different herbs to help support the heart and help to work as a natural diuretic can make a big difference and can help you to kind of maybe get to the lowest effective dose of those medications. So number one is dandelion. Dandelion root is a natural diuretic, and it works wonderfully for animals that have congestive heart failure or have a buildup of fluid in their chest or even in their abdomen for, you know, a variety of different reasons, but most commonly heart disease. Dandelion root is, is nice, and it's different from the furosemide or the pharmaceutical diuretics in that it's not going to just pull water out of the body at the expense of different organs that might benefit from the moisture. It, it pulls fluid from where it needs to be taken out of, and it, it's, it strikes a balance in the body where it doesn't tip things in one direction. So dandelion root is the natural diuretic that I use. Hawthorn is the herb that I use to help keep the heart um, functioning as well as it can. So, and there is a number of different supplements that you can find that have dandelion, that have hawthorn in them. Um, if you would, if you would want to contact me through my website, email or call, and I can give you some of those supplements that I use that have both of those ingredients in them. Wonderful. Um, and we have uh, some questions about heartworm. Um, and we would like to know what would be a natural heartworm preventative? Mm -hmm, that's a great question. And unfortunately, there is not a very effective natural heartworm preventative that I have found. And that's why I usually recommend just giving the heartworm preventative. And it's safe to give it every six weeks instead of every four weeks. So you can really minimize how often you're giving it, giving the heartworm preventative every six weeks and just doing it seasonally. And then my other recommendation is to give milk thistle, which is that liver detoxifier, the day that you give the heartworm preventative and for about three to five days after giving the heartworm preventative, which is ivermectin. Ivermectin is the name of the drug. 
um, most commonly that's used in those heartworm preventatives. So it really helps the body flush out that ivermectin, get rid of it, helps, helps your pet's body kind of deal with it. And as far as the dewormers go, it's the dose of ivermectin to Where? prevent heartworm disease is pretty low. So, yeah, so that's the thing. There is not, a, not an effective natural heartworm preventative, unfortunately. We just had a question come in um, that was about dosing. How do you decide about dosing with, uh, like, a, on supplements, you might have a chihuahua, you might have a mastiff? Oh, definitely. And that's why it's so important, if you can, talk to a veterinarian that knows, a holistic vet, somebody that knows the herbs and how to use them and how to dose them. Because every animal is so different. And, yeah, you're talking about a three-pound chihuahua or 180-pound St. Bernard. There's such, such a wide variety of dosing differences. And you don't want to go off of the human dose and just um, titrate it down because some animals are so small. So it's important to talk to a vet to figure out the dosage, taking into account the health of the animal, if they have a sensitive stomach or not. Usually I recommend starting out at a low dose and increasing. So that's where it is important to, to talk to somebody who can really help you out with the dosing information. We have a question about, um, that, back to the pet food, I'm concerned about my dog's teeth with homemade soft food. So first, I guess, is it true that when a dog eats soft food that it damages their teeth? And second, if so, is there anything that they should add to that or anything supplemental that they should do to protect their teeth? Boy, I have seen such a difference in animals that are fed a homemade or a raw food versus animals that eat either a canned food or a dry kibble. The animals that eat homemade food or raw food, their teeth are beautiful. And you will be amazed if you start to feed more of a fresh food, it doesn't stick to the teeth. A lot of the kibbles out there, the dry foods, that's, you know, that's kind of something that the old statement was, you know, feed them a dry food so it doesn't, so it cleans their teeth as, as they eat. And it really, it's, it doesn't work like that. What The biggest thing that I see is the moisture content in the food that they're eating. If they're taking in a lot of moisture, like what's in the fresh foods or in the raw foods that you can add water to, their, the food isn't sticking to their teeth. So your animal is going to have better teeth. I can almost guarantee it if you make the switch to the homemade or the raw food versus the kibble. And the thing is with those dry foods is the animals don't typically drink enough water to make up for the dryness in that food. So that food is sticky. It sticks to their teeth. And that's what really contributes to the decay and the dental disease. So that would be my recommendation is just try it and you'll notice the difference. But one thing that you can do to keep your pet's teeth as clean as possible naturally is to let them chew on some raw bones or antlers are another great one that you can give. As long as you are doing raw bones and they're big enough so your animal is not going to be able to ingest them, and it, it certainly depends on the dog, and you do have to be careful. You never want to give them cooked bones because cooked bones can splinter off. They're very brittle. They can cause a lot of problems if the animal ingests them. Overall, raw bones are like those big beef bones that you can get from the butcher. They're very soft. The marrow that's inside can be beneficial for their, your animal as long as they're not getting too much, and it's a natural toothbrush. And the same with the antlers. You can get deer antlers, elk antlers, all sorts of different antler types. And a lot of dogs will love chewing on them, and they keep their teeth clean. Excellent. Great information. Mm -hmm. uh, now we move on to the thyroid gland. We have a question. Is there a natural thyroid support to replace or use with siloxine for a 16-year-old dog, a terrier mutt mix, diagnosed mm -hmm. with hypothyroidism? Oh, boy. You know, that's... That's one of those issues that I found you can use herbals, you can use food to really support your animal's endocrine system and their whole thyroid uh, gland and all of parathyroid glands, pituitary glands, all of those glands. But for most animals that are hypothyroid, which is most common in dogs, 
or hyperthyroid, which is most common in cats, most often you have to give the medication, the supplement. And there are different different herbs that I have have used in animals, but quite honestly, it's they often have to stay on those medications just to keep their thyroid levels where they should be. Great. We have a question about probiotics and enzymes. Is it safe for animals to take the same varieties that humans take? So it's not mm -hmm. like do animals need um, a different kind of probiotic versus humans, or do they have different digestive enzymes than humans? Mm, that's a great question. I No, you can use the same types of probiotics and digestive enzymes that you take for your pets which is really nice. You know, it makes it more convenient. And same thing with the, the fish oil or the omega-3 fatty acids. You can use the same, same supplements that you take for yourself for your animals. Um, the probiotics, I mean, dogs and cats certainly have different types of flora in their GI tracts, but if you're adding in a probiotic that you take, it will, it will have a similar benefit for your pet. So it's very, very fine to use the same. But, you know, and having said that, there are animal supplements that I think are probably, if you can do it, are even better because they are more specific for animals. So if you're able to get an animal-specific probiotic digestive enzyme, even better. But if not, it's okay to use the same. Excellent. Yeah. Um, another question, uh, are pigs' ears also good for cleaning the dog's teeth? So well, they wouldn't be probably as hard, would they, or as a... Right, exactly. They don't, what I find is they don't chew on them the same way that they would chew on a bone or an antler. So I would say no. I mean, I really think anything that kind of gets the saliva going, helps to flush out the mouth, can be beneficial. So I think it would help in that regard. But as physically removing some of the tartar, removing some of the food that's sitting there, probably not as effective as a bone or an antler. Okay. And another question, is garlic bad for dogs? Mm, that's another great question. Yeah, there is, there is a lot of information out there saying that garlic is, can be toxic to the dogs, and it's, not, it's absolutely not true. Uh, what the problem is is that onions are very, can be very toxic to dogs and cats. So onions can cause anemia in certain dogs and cats, certainly not all of them, but it's important to stay away from onions because garlic is in the same family. A lot of vets recommend just staying away from everything, garlic and onions. But garlic is such a benefit for dogs and for cats. Adding in a little bit, bit of garlic with the food will help to boost their immune system. It's a natural flea and tick repellent, either internally as well as externally. So I think garlic is great. Anything in a high dose can, of course, be toxic, whether you're talking about herbs, medications, anything like that. So keeping it at a low dose, um, you know, in moderation is always, always a wise thing to do. Another question about supplements, is coconut oil and Bragg's apple cider good for animals, for both cats and dogs? Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. Apple cider vinegar is amazing to me because so many animals don't mind the taste of it. If you put in, you know, for an, an average-sized dog, one to two teaspoons in with their water or mixed in with their food, a lot of dogs love it, and it's great. It's kind of just one of those all over, kind of like for humans, you know, just a health tonic helps to balance out the pH level in the body. So I will often recommend it for animals that have, dogs and cats that have bladder issues. So recurrent bladder infections, uh, urinary tract crystals, anything like that, the apple cider vinegar can benefit. Um, you can also use it as a natural ear wash. And actually both of those things, apple cider vinegar, is a great antiseptic that you can use straight or you can dilute it 50-50 with water and use that as a natural ear wash. The coconut oil, I also use it for animals that have very mild ear infections, whether it's yeast or bacterial. Put a dollop of coconut oil right into their ear and then it kind of melts and it turns liquid and you can use that as kind of like an ear treatment. 
So, or you can give it orally too, and you can add it in with the food. It's great for skin. So, yeah, both of those are are can be very helpful. Um, going, you know, you mentioned. Uh, so, you sort of answered another question partially. A person has says you will probably understand this better than me. Royal Canon Urinary for cats. My vet keeps trying to convince me that my cat needs to stay on it for the bladder crystals she had a few mm-hmm. years back. Is there a natural remedy for that? So it sounds like the Bragg's apple cider vinegar would be very useful for this cat. Anything else? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Cats can get a couple different types of crystals, but most commonly cats get something called struvite or triple phosphate crystals, which can then turn into bladder stones. So the crystals will start to develop if the pH level in the urine or in the bladder is too alkaline. So getting the urine to become more acidic is the key. And if you can get the urine to be of a pH level between 6 and 7, you're you're not going to have a problem with bacterial infections. You're not going to have a problem with the crystals, which is a lot of those urinary tract prescription foods then what they do is they bring the pH level down of the urine. So you can certainly do that with just adding in some supplements and not going towards a prescription food. But that is something I would say, you know, talking to a vet, you can email or you can call me, maybe setting up a time just to talk about different supplements that you can add in. The vinegar is great, but there are some other things like um, – uh, L-methionine is a urinary acidifier for cats and dogs. So something like that. There are a number of supplements that have a number of different ingredients, some herbs in there too, that will bring the pH level down that will make a huge difference. Excellent. Um, mm-hmm. This one, this person, we, wow, it's almost like we had we went through dog questions and now we're on to cat questions. Um, <laughs> what do you recommend for a cat that has mouth sores? Hmm, that depends. I mean, there are a number of different things, I guess, that would probably cause that. Some different viruses can cause that. Some cats can just have stomatitis, which can cause sores inside the mouth, and that's more of an immune-mediated issue. So, again, with so many things, I recommend just going back to basics. Look at the food. You know, eliminate any extras, any preservatives in the food, Get the fresher, the better, the more simple that you can get the food as far as simple ingredients, controlling the ingredients that your animal is taking in, getting the best quality that you can. A lot of times you see a difference with any number of issues by just getting, by changing the food. And then, you know, taking it from there. If you're not seeing a change, you know, after, and with any food change, I would say give it six to eight weeks because it takes at least six weeks for the old food to get out of the system, for the new food to get incorporated in, before you say, oh, well, this isn't working, or, you know, I'm not seeing a difference. You have to give it some time. It's not instant. But that's where I would start, is is with the food and see if you notice a change. Here's a very timely question. Um, this is about Roundup and other things that are used on our lawns to keep our mm-hmm. lawns attractive. Mm-hmm. So there's several types of treatments that some people license individuals to come out and spray their lawns. Some people do it themselves. Some people use Roundups uh, in just specific areas for weeds. How harmful is it for dog and cat exposure to go outside and walk in this treated gla- grass? And is how long would it take, I mean, before that if there is a problem before that would dissipate? Mm, that, you know, that's a huge question. And it's something that I worry a lot about, and I don't really know the answer. Um, I worry about animals. If you just think about it, they have no protection on their feet. And they're walking out there, and they're coming into contact with so many pesticides, so many chemicals, so many things. And like what I mentioned, you know, using lavender on the pads of their feet so it gets absorbed in their system. Well, anything they're walking on is getting absorbed in their system. So I do worry about that. And I worry about some of these chronic diseases and cancer that we see and how much of that 
is because of animals are coming into contact with some of these things out there? I don't know. But I would say as much as you can limit your pest exposure to chemically treated, the pesticides, the better, whether it's something that's out there on the grass or whether it's those flea and tick treatments, limiting their exposure is the better. And you, you do the best that you can. You know, you cannot control everything, but you do the best that you can. And like I mentioned before, the allergies, if you have some, some of those unscented baby wipes by your door just wiping your pet's feet off, when they come in from being outside, you're going to be removing anything or most anything, at least, that might be sitting there that could potentially get absorbed into their system. Um, there's a recommendation from one of our listeners for that lysine might be useful for mouth sores. Have you ever heard yeah, that? Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, definitely. Lysine is a wonderful immune booster in cats. And I will often use lysine for cats that have chronic herpes virus. And herpes virus shows up in cats as like watery eyes, kind of chronic upper respiratory infections. And certainly if there is anything going on in their mouth, it's not going to hurt and it could certainly help. It helps to boost the immune system and stops the replication of that herpes virus. So lysine is something that you can give to your cats at 500 milligrams twice a day if they're showing active signs of either an upper respiratory infection, watery eyes, or, you know, potentially even these mouth sores, it's not going to do any harm. And it's kind of like a maintenance dose, 250 milligrams once a day. So that's something that's kind of standard across the board. Any cat can take that. If you give too much, their body is just not going to use it. So very safe and can help boost the immune system. We are almost out of time, but there's two things. One's a quick question and one may not be quite so quick that I'd like to squeeze in prior to uh, the end of today's webinar. And one is, um, do you have experience with cancer? Do you work with animals with cancer? So that, mm -hmm. is that part of your practice? It's a huge part of my practice. And if there is one thing that I am, it, the more that I am in practice, the more passionate I become about it is natural cancer care and even integrative cancer care. There are so many things that you can do naturally, whether you choose, if your animal is diagnosed with cancer, whether you choose to go the route of chemotherapy, radiation therapy, some of the vaccines that are out there, um, adding in some natural support, or if you choose to just go that natural way, it can make such a huge difference for animals with cancer. And anybody that's listening, um, I really encourage you to seek out natural alternatives for any issue, but especially cancer. I, do, I see a lot of patients that really respond well to acupuncture, to herbs, to homeopathic remedies. I do a combination of everything for animals that have cancer. They do wonderful, and they feel better. It improves their quality of life at the very least and can really, can really help. You know, oh, yeah. I have a test. I have a testimonial. I have a Siberian. I had a Siberian husky that, at um, um, almost nine years old, so she was a little over eight, almost nine years old, was diagnosed with leukemia, mm -hmm. and they said that she had six weeks to live with no treatment, and that we might get a year if we went through chemotherapy, mm -hmm. but that would mean serious chemotherapy. The dog would have to spend one day a week in the vet's office, and lots of really serious adverse effects. And, and I work full time and she would be home alone with those serious adverse effects. So they said they could give her uh, some steroids to help suppress her immune system and maybe keep her alive for a couple of months, sort of for closure. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> anyway, long story short, I went on, uh, did some natural interventions, some supplements, a couple of supplements, and uh, she lived uh, till she was 11. I, I got two, two and a half solid more years wow. of healthy, happy life. Now, oh her last month of life, she was really starting to slow down. She was losing her appetite, but um, it's really made – I almost sometimes believe that some of these natural interventions work better in, in our pets than they do in humans because there's not as many complicating factors. I know. You know, human, you can't say, I'm putting you on this kibble and I want you to eat only this kibble. <laughs> you know? <laughs> We don't want you to go into any nightclubs. We don't want you to do what I mean. We can, we can control so many extraneous factors with exactly. our little animal yeah. friends that, you know, mm -hmm. that sometimes these natural remedies work even better than they do in humans. 
Uh, I know. It's amazing to me how well animals respond to every any sort of natural supplement, and I think you're exactly right. So, yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, this has been, we, as, as evidenced by the sheer volume of questions that are coming in, hugely popular. Uh, we really thank you so much. There's a big need out there for people who have interest in and understanding of and expertise in treating animals with integrative medicine. Uh, we've had lots of requests for copies of this presentation. Um, you will be receiving a link uh, very soon. We do upload these to the Terry Talks Nutrition website. So if you are interested and would like to listen again, you certainly may. Um, if you have others that you think would like to listen, you can certainly do that as well. Um, we will also um, be uh, more than happy, as, as you've evidenced on this slide, uh, you've got the contact information for Dr. Donahue in order to contact her if you need uh, to avail yourself of her services. Um, and we thank all of you for uh, attending today. Um, we appreciate all of your help with uh, listening to and learning about natural interventions for our canine and our and our feline friends. Um, we have some upcoming events, Better Than Chemo, The Promise of Grape Seed Extract, that will be presented by natural health expert Terry Lemerand on October 21st. And on October 28th, Natural Approaches to Parkinson's Disease, Jacob Teitelbaum, MD. These will not be pet-centric, but I still believe that uh, we need to take care of our human friends with natural interventions as well. So thank you again, Dr. Donahue. Uh, for more information, you can follow Terry on uh, Twitter at twitter.com backslash Terry Limerand. You can sign up at Terry Talks Nutrition for a free weekly newsletter. Um, we are very scrupulous with your emails. We will not be selling them to others. Uh, if you want to be, hear the latest news in natural health, that's the place where you can listen to recordings of past seminars, including this one. That's terrytalksnutrition.com. So thank you again, Dr. Donahue. I hope that you'll come back and join us again for another presentation. Thank you so much. I definitely will. Yes, thank you. Take care to all of our attendees today. Thank you for taking time out of your busy day to learn more about natural interventions for pet health. Until we meet again, good health to you. Bye-bye.